Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Preventing Postoperative Hypocalcemia in Thyroid Surgery with Fluorescent Visualization of Parathyroid Glands. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of your attendee control panel. We encourage you to send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We will collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Fernando Dip. Dr. Dip is a surgeon and medical researcher from Buenos Aires, Argentina. He was trained in general surgery at the Hospital de Clinicas, University of Buenos Aires, where he performed a fellowship in surgical oncology. In 2010, he was appointed as staff of the cancer division of the University of Buenos Aires. In 2011, Dr. Dip began research at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. Since 2013, Dr. Dip has served as associate faculty at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. From 2012 to 2018, Dr. Dip was a tenured investigator at the University of Buenos Aires and Cleveland Clinic in near infrared guided surgery field. Dr. Dip also served as the chief of surgical research. So without further ado, Dr. Dip, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Diagnostic Green for the support in order to do this series of webinars. In this opportunity, I will review the main concepts that support the use of near infrared technology in order to make thyroidectomy safer. I will also go through the first randomized control trial performed by Raul Rosenthal, Jorge Falco, and myself that demonstrate the decrease of hypocalcemia after the surgical procedures. The first question that needs to be answered when we use this kind of technology, first of all, if it is worth it or not, and how the technology will help the surgeon in the OR. These are my disclosures. And in order to start, we need to describe that when it comes to thyroidectomies, unfortunately, we find severe and frequent complications. Temporary hypoparathyroidism resulting in hypocalcemia is the most common complication after total thyroidectomy. And it has been seen up to 50% of patients undergoing the procedure. Hypocalcemia occurring for over six months after thyroid surgeries is defined as permanent hypocalcemia. And it may occur between 0.9 and 6.6% of the cases. Transient and permanent hypocalcemia represent up to 60% of all complications. Hypocalcemia can also lead <clears throat> uh, hypocalcemia can lead to lifelong dependency of calcium supplementation with an increased risk of osteoporosis, neuromuscular symptoms, and long-term complications such as cerebral, vascular, ocular, or renal damage. The incidence of hypoparathyroidism has been associated by surgical skills, experience, knowledge of parathyroid anatomy, and the extent of the resection, knowing the anatomical position and vascular supply of the parathyroid glands, is essential to avoid hypoparathyroidism after thyroid surgery. When parathyroid glands are injured, intraoperative parathyroid autotransplantation also may be helpful. Nevertheless, early recognition needs to be done. In an effort to avoid an advert parathyroidectomy or the disruption of parathyroid vasculature, a capsular dissection technique has been well described. Beyond surgical technique, however, tools to help identify and assess parathyroid gland intraoperatively are limited. The risk of parathyroid gland injury was first described many years ago by Halstead in 1907. 
in a study of more than 100 cadaveric thyroid glands, it has been described 38% to 2% of the parathyroid feeding vessels were considered at risk for damage by dissection during standard thyroidectomy. Since these arteries are terminal vessels, systematic identifications, precise surgical dissection, and microlatures are key in reducing the frequency of iatrogenic hypoparathyroidism. Intraoperative guidelines guidance to help identify and assess the parathyroid glands during thyroid surgery may provide identification of parathyroid glands during the surgical procedure and reduce the operative time, helping surgeons focus on performing the exploration. Prevent surgical damage is very important and it also will help to predict the postoperative parathyroid function to the surgeons and of course a better postoperative outcome and quality of life for patients. In the sign green fluorescence and parathyroid autofluorescence are two recent techniques that aim to help with the intraoperative identification of parathyroid glands during thyroidectomy. In the first, in the first one, we use the inner properties of parathyroid glands to see them, to identify them, and the technique is important to localize the glands. On the other hand, to evaluate the perfusion of the glands, endocyanin green has to be performed, used in order to evaluate the perfusion. When we talk about autofluorescence, we need to name different authors. Parath described the use of autofluorescence with a Raman technique to differentiate parathyroid glands from other tissues and identify, she identified a statistical greater numbers of parathyroid glands when near infrared light was employed compared with the standard white light. The group of Sheden also distinguished that when surgeons use a photodynamic eye system, they can evaluate glands from the intrinsic fluorescence of neighboring tissues because parathyroid glands exhibit a higher level of intrinsic fluorescence than surrounding lymph nodes and uh, other uh, structures. The group of uh, our group, uh, led by Jorge Falco, also identified a higher number of glands, and uh, we recreated um, other studies in order to demonstrate the decrease of hypocalcemia. The group of France, led by Binod, he described the a decrease of hypocalcemia from 20.9 versus 5.2 when near infrared light is used. Few control data have been published documenting actual reduction in post-thyroidectomy hypocalcemia incidence with near infrared light is used as for a thyroid gland identification tool, and these were within rather than between subject comparisons. But unfortunately, all of these studies have been reported so far. But they are report court studies or series of cases. While very promising, this technology needs a higher level of evidence. That is why our group conducted a randomized control trials. Randomized control trials are the most rigorous way of determining whether a cost-effect relation exists between treatment and outcome and for assessing the cost effectiveness of the treatment. They have several important features, random allocation to intervention groups. This is the first randomized control trial in which near infrared light was evaluated by several surgeons as an intraoperative tool to enhance post-thyroidectomy outcomes. The current uh, randomized control trial had two primary aims. First one, to compare the effectiveness of using near infrared light versus white light during total thyroidectomies to identify parathyroid glands early in the procedure. And second, to evaluate the effectiveness of near infrared light again relative to white light as a means to reduce the incidence of postoperative hypocalcemia. As a secondary objective, also we sought to identify predictors, predictors of postoperative hypocalcemia. So a prospective randomized control trial was conducted. We involved 170 patients when they went total thyroidectomy. Four trained head and neck surgeons performed all the procedures. 
to eligible for the study, the patient had to be older than 18 years old, have a clinical indication for total thyroidectomy, not have preoperative hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia, or any condition that would predispose them to either. Patients who had had any previous neck surgery, candidate for thyroid lobectomy, and those who require neck dissection were excluded for the study. Patients were blocked randomized by one of the authors into two groups in a one-one ratio using a computer-generated random sequence of odd and even numbers, yielding 85 participants in each group. We put together two different groups. For patients in the non-experimental group, surgeons only use white light and anatomical landmarks throughout the procedure to identify the parathyroid glands. And to identify parathyroid glands in the experimental group, both white light and near-infrared light were used to illuminate the surgical field. This occurred twice after retracting the thyroid gland, but before thyroid dissection, the latter involving opening the sternum of thyroid muscle and metallicizing the thyroid gland somewhat, but not yet having dissected the capsule and after thyroid resection. The outcome measures of interest were one, total number of parathyroid glands identified by surgeon using white light versus using near infrared light, postoperative uh, serum calcium level, the presence versus absence of postoperative hypocalcemia, and symptomatic postoperative hypocalcemia, mean hospital stays in days, and the need for calcium replacement. In this case, the fluobin 800 system was used to evaluate parathyroid gland fluorescence. It consists of a filter camera that has both white light and near infrared light source. In the near infrared light, it is captured by parathyroid tissue that responds by re emitting light of the same spectrum, but with a longer wavelength. A filter camera that only detects wavelengths between 800 and 900 nanometers detect this longer parathyroid emitted wavelength. On the screen, the parathyroid glands appear as a small, wide, round, well-delineated spots. Each patient's serum calcium level was measured on post-operative day one, as well as one week and six month post-procedure. Hypocalcemia was operationally defined as a serum calcium level below eight milligram deciliters, Asymptomatic patient with a serum calcium level between 7.6 and 7.9 milligram deciliters were treated with calcium oral replacement. Patient whose serum calcium level was below 7.6 milligram deciliters and patient whose hypocalcemia was considered symptomatic were treated with intravenous administrated calcium replacement and monitored closely. Postoperative hypocalcemia was considered persistent if the serum calcium remained below 8 milligram deciliters at the six month follow up visit. Power analysis was performed to determine the number of patients required. A baseline estimated incidence of 40% was used, drawing from four recent published international studies to detect a 50% relative reduction in hypocalcemia from 40% down to an incidence of 20% with 95% confidence and 90% power, 79 subjects were necessary in each group. This number was rounding up to 85 per group to account for potential subjects. When we look at the results, we're going to see that we included 170 patients as mentioned before, all had consented to undergo total thyroidectomy for a variety of primary conditions, the two most common being cancer in 48.2% and goitia in 38.8%. 74% of the patients were female and the overall mean age was 47.3 years old. The total time that the Fluobin 800 system was used to evaluate for a thyroid gland fluorescence ranged from three minutes to five minutes. In addition, either one or two additional parathyroid glands were identified in two-thirds of near-infrared light group subjects during the process of tubing from white light to near-infrared light. In the near-infrared light group, the number of parathyroid glands visualized prior to thyroid dissection increased from 2.6 to 3.5 
when white light was to go to near infrared light, and this was statistical significant. No difference was observed in the number of parathyroid glands identified in control with white light after thyroid dissection, and the number identified the near infrared light group using near infrared light prior to thyroid dissection. In four patients, autotransplantation of parathyroid glands was needed when parathyroid tissue was recognized with near infrared light on the thyroid gland surface after the thyroidectomy had been performed. Parathyroid tissue was confirmed by the frozen section before reimplantation. Postoperatively, the incidence of hypocalcemia was 8.2 in the near infrared light group versus 16.5 among controls, a 50% relative reduction in the near infrared light group that nonetheless just failed to achieve for the light statistical significance. More severe hypocalcemia, defined as serum calcium level lower than 7.5 milligram deciliter, was observed in just 1.2% in the near infrared light visualization group versus 11.8% in the white light group, a difference that was highly significant. In the near infrared group, the minimum calcium level recorded was operatively was 7.5 milligram deciliter. Conversely, in the white light group, six patients had a serum calcium level below, below 7.5 milligram deciliters, the lower recorded being 6.8 milligram. Six patients, 7% in the near infrared light group, required hospitalization versus 12 in the control group while the mean days of hospitalization were 0.11 versus 0.26 in the two groups, respectively. No patient experienced permanent hypocalcemia with serum calcium level uh, uh, more than 8 milligram deciliters in all patients by six months of follow-up. No patient was lost to follow-up. In our trial, since virtually as many parathyroid glands were observed prior to thyroidectomy with near infrared light as after thyroidectomy when white light was employed, less dissection was required in the former group, logically reducing the surgical risk of disrupting parathyroid circulation. But unfortunately, we could not achieve a 0% of hypocalcemia. That is why we believe that also as a complement of this, there is a huge role for the use of indocyanin in green. And we, when we talk about indocyanin in green, we are talking about fluorescent angiography. The use of indocyanin in green angiography has been shown to better assess perfusion than visual inspection for bowel well resection and reconstructive procedures, resulting in an improved clinical outcomes. ICG use in thyroidectomy has recently become a new topic in endocrine surgery with several groups reporting their experiences. It allows intraoperative detection as well as perfusion assessment of parathyroid glands. This technique looks promising given the high detection rate of parathyroid glands and fewer incidental parathyroidectomy and with ICG fluorescence imaging compared to traditional detection method. For in this case, uh, IC, the IC flow device is used uh, this is a very small unit with a touch screen connected to a portable camera. After the device is turned on, but prior to use, ring balance is adjusted using uh, a card. The device then is placed in a, in a sterile drape, and after injecting the signing ring, the handheld camera is held 15 to 20 centimeters from the tissue, and the resulting image is displayed on a touch screen uh, monitor controller. In the in green as a dye was originally developed by Kodak Research Laboratories in 1955. In 1956 was when in green was first approved for human use to study the hepatic and cardiac system by the Food and Drug Administration. In the 1980s, some researchers in Japan applied in the in green and geography in the ophthalmic field. And at the same time, a considerable amount of literature had been published on ICG in the United States. These studies highlighted the potential application of indocyanin in green and geography. Indocyanin in green is an anionic water soluble molecule that rapidly binds plasma lipoproteins when injected intravenously. Once excited by near infrared, a wavelength of 800 nanometers. 
The ICG will fluoresce, used for decades for ophthalmic and geography innovations in near infrared imaging systems have expanded the use of ICG fluorescence to a wide range of general surgical and oncological procedures, including intraoperative cholangiography, assessment on anastomotic perfusions, and sentinel lymph node mapping. It is a, an inexpensive dive and allows a real-time assessment of parathyroid gland viability within minutes of the ICG injection, which confers a potential cost advantage of using intraoperative endocyanin urinal geography. The preparation of the dye is important. It comes in with a 25 milligram ICG that can be made, it is mixed with 10 milliliters of sterile water. It is intravenously administrated. And then after the administration, the catheter is purged after each injector for rapid imaging uh, again. The, um, it's really very safe. The allergic reaction that has been reported in the literature are associated with the iodine and those patients that has previous allergies to iodine are predisposed to have this uh, adverse reaction but the rate of complication that has been reported is 0.001%. What is the real do dose that has to be used in order to see the parathyroid glands? There's no consensus in the literature yet. Different authors report different doses. The group of Su, that he was the first that described the use of ICG to evaluate the perfusion of the parathyroid gland, he tried from 12.5 microgram kilogram to 100 uh, microgram kilogram, and he established an optimal dose of 18.75 microgram kilogram. The group of sound, he reported uh, doses from 3.25 milligram to 5 milligram, and then other authors even uh, higher doses like 10 milligram. Others do not report the doses in milligrams, they use just milliliters, three milliliters or 3.5 milliliters. In our experience, we prefer to use lower doses in order to avoid the uptake of the thyroid gland. When is the uh, best time to administrate ICG to visualize the parathyroid glands? It should be administrated just before aiming to visualize the parathyroid glands. Once the thyroid gland is retracted. And we know that after 30 seconds, the uh, endocyanin ring is going to reach the parathyroid glands and they are going to be uh, seen. In order to analyze if they are well perfused or non well perfused, there are different scores that has been described in the literature the gray scale, the one to three grading scale, or the one to three percentage of ICG uptake. And we know that when we use the gray scale, black is going to be no perfusion, gray with some perfusion, and white with full, full, full perfusion. And then gray scale, there are authors that put numbers according to the color that, that they are going to have, black, gray, or white. And then uh, they are analyzed. And then percentage of uptake is zero if they represent no uptake, one represented uptake lower than 30% of the volume of the gland, two represented uptake in 30 to 70%, and then three if this represents an uptake in more than 70% of the, the gland. What is the impact of these scales uh, in the hypocalcemia? This can be used as a prediction of hypocalcemia. The group of Fortuny reported that the identification of at least one gland with endocyanin green angiography viability of two was 100% predictive of normal parathyroid gland function postoperatively. Others suggest that patients with at least one normal gland had an accuracy of 57% and sensitivity of 58%. However, when patients have at least two glands with endocyanin green angiography score of two, the accuracy and sensitivity were increased by 63% and 72% re respectively. We may find a discordance here because we need to consider that we have a false negative rate of 6% and this can be due uh, mainly for two different reasons. First of all, because the parathyroid glands may 
uh, experience a transient ischemia during the dissection. And then it depends on the experience on the surgeons, on the use of indocyanin in green. Manipulation of the uh, thyroid gland also is very important that can cause damage to the blood supply. The, we need to consider the bright background signal due to the highly vascularized uh, malignant tissue in some cases and also to the normal thyroid glands. The anatomical location of the inferior parathyroid glands has to be considered when we evaluate these images. And of course, the nearby artery uh, can confuse also the location of the parathyroid glands. That's why the experience is really very important. The systematic use of ICG and geography will allow surgeons to understand the vascular mapping of the parathyroid gland feeding vessels. And this might clarify awareness of the anatomy and location of the parathyroid glands, as well as the presence of vascular loops, which are often very close to the thyroid parenchyma. The use of this technology does not interrupt the working flow. It takes only five minutes and 35 seconds average to use the endocyanin in green. And the rate of the parathyroid glands that we can detect with this technology is really very high. It has been described 84% to 100% when using ICG and, and between 77% and 100% while using autofluorescence. What is the future of this technology? We, can, uh, we need to analyze that the future uh, will be directed to specific delineation, delineation of structures. ICG and other dyes will be bound to antibodies and receptors. The main objectives will be to differentiate between normal tissues and also to evaluate the difference between normal and malignant tumors. The second point that has to be addressed is that characterization of the images with numbers. Different diagnosis modalities like CT scan or PET CT allow uh, physicians to differentiate different structures according to the intensity of the signal. Same thing will occur with fluorescent technology together with Raul Rosenthal and others we are working in, in order to put uh, numbers and to better uh, understand the fluorescent images. One of the main disadvantages of all this technology is the poor penetration of the light through the different tissues. That means, for example, that parathyroid glands cannot be visualized before the procedure. The near infrared light cannot penetrate the skin, the muscles, and the thyroid gland, but also it's a, a very important real-time tool that improves, as mentioned before, the visualization. Image, pro image projection is the last, the last step of the evolution of this technology. Now we are looking at the fluorescent imaging that are projected on a screen. This is not a big problem because surgeons nowadays are used to work looking at the monitor when performing laparoscopic interventions. In some cases, though, it will be important to have the fluorescent images on the patients on the surgical field to better delineate the tissues um, to dissect and to protect. So in order to conclude, we can say that autofluorescence and perfusion with ICG are very useful tools and cost-effective tools to detect and evaluate vitality of parathyroid glands. Near-infrared fluorescent uh, parathyroid glands identification guides the surgeon during the dissection, and near-infrared light has the potential to decrease the incidence of more severe post-operative hypocalcemia. I would like to thank you, uh, Paul, very much. And I would like also to invite you to the next um, surgery of the Forget Symposium and the next fluorescent meeting organized by Raul Rosenthal. It's going to be held uh, in Miami uh, next February. And also I invite you all to uh, participate and to get involved to the ISFGS society that we put together. Thank you very much. Dr. Dip, thank you so much for your presentation. We are now going to begin answering the questions that have been submitted so far during the presentation. But as a reminder, you can still send your questions in via the questions box on your attendee control panel. Dr. Dip, our first question here. 
does autofluorescence correlate with perfusion of the PT, of the PT glands? There are different uh, kind of procedures or methods. Um, in one uh, procedure, in autofluorescent one, what we do is to evaluate where the glands are, but we cannot determine if they are well perfused or not. It, in the signing green, on the contrary, we can evaluate if they are well perfused or not. So the the utility of those. Uh, methods are uh, complementary. So we use both in order to evaluate the location and also the perfusion of the glands. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next question. Do you see autofluorescence as a tool to verify if packed glands are viable when transplanted? No, what we do with um, the autofluorescence is to evaluate again uh, if the tissue is a parathyroid gland or not. If we find that the parathyroid gland was in the middle of the dissection, for example, when we perform a central uh, no dissection, we um, take the we illuminate the surgical field with equipment. We certify that it's a parathyroid gland. Uh, if we need to sacrifice them because you know the tumor is in the middle and, and first of all it's more important to um, resect the, the tumor and not to preserve a parathyroid glands, then we can separate uh, guided by the near infrared light the parathyroid glands and then we reimplant it. But the autofluorescence is not going to tell you, us if this is well perfused or not. Thank you very much. And I hope I've understood this question correctly. Was there a difference in preoperative localizing studies between the two groups in the randomized study? The, um, the, we we do, didn't uh, evaluate any preoperative location of the, the glands in the randomized control trial. It was a real time evaluation of the parathyroid glands in order to evaluate for us, we evaluated the location of the glands in order to evaluate if this, um, in order, we wanted to consider if evaluating the location of the glands will have an impact of the decrease of the hypocalcemia after the procedure. Thank you. Um, and our next question, have you compared autofluorescence to ICG when visualizing the PT gland? We did, but we did in different moments. So we both, we use both uh, methods. One, the autofluorescence in order to localize the glands. And the secondly, then if we want to see if the glands are well vascularized or not, then we administrate ICG and we use the ICG and geography but in different moments. That's why there are uh, complements and it's not that we are going to use one uh, method or the other one. We use both. Fabulous, thank you very much for that clarification. Our next question here, how deep does the autofluorescent detect the PT gland? Do you actually need to expose the gland or can it pre penetrate through other tissues? If they are, they can can penetrate um, a, a little bit the tissue. We don't need to dissect the glands, and this is why this is really very important. Of course, because the near infrared light cannot penetrate the muscle and the thyroid glands, we need to start the dissection by retracting the gland. But uh, the the most important concept of the autofluorescence of the parathyroid glands is that they can see before uh, the surgeon. So if we compare white light and near infrared light, we are going to see the parathyroid glands before by using near infrared gland compared uh, a white light. And this is why this is so important because once we dissected the gland, probably we have already injured the gland. We can see before the glands, we are going to protect the glands, and then we are going to check the vitality. Thank you very much. And moving on to our next question. 
would you say visualization of a parathyroid adenoma and a normal parathyroid gland would require the same effort? Is the adenoma easier to visualize? Yes, so we, in order to um, visualize the adenoma, we do all the preoperative study that has to be performed. We don't replace them because a near infrared light cannot be used before the procedure, but it, sometimes the adenomas are big and ver they are very easy to find, so we don't need any kind of uh, technology, but in some cases to find the adenomas may be difficult and near infrared light has demonstrated uh, to be very useful in order to guide our dissection while looking for them. Thank you. Um, moving on, we've still got loads of questions for you. Does autofluorescence detect truly intrathyroid parathyroids? We have found that uh, if they are really in the low, of course, they are not going to uh, glow. But if they are under the capsule, uh, we we have found it. You know those parathyroid glands that are uh, binded over very close to the thyroid glands, and we could uh, protect them. Thank you. And I'm keeping an eye on the time, and we've got time for a few more questions. Do you believe that this technology will become a standard of care? I believe this technology should be a standard of care because it allows us to see more. And we have described this technology or compared this technology with a GPS. If you have something that can guide you, that is not expensive, and if you're uh, going to talk to a patient and to, to tell the patient that you have a technology, uh, you know, that is going to give you more information. It's going to protect structures, not only parathyroid glands, but, you know, bile ducts uh, or uh, perfusion. We, we evaluate, for example, perfusion in colorectal surgery, and we can avoid leaks. If you can see more, you should use it, definitely. That's why I believe it should be used as a standard uh, of care. And a question that follows on nicely from that, um, should this technology be used routinely or would you still use it selectively? You know, when, when you are operating, you never know what is going to happen. So uh, even though you may have experience in one procedure, we found we have complications. And if we come, have complications, it's because uh, something is going on. So we need to detect what is going on. And, and some of the things that we have realized is that we don't recognize the structures that we should be. Now we have a technology that is available that we can use routinely in the OR as considering that we um, never know what is going on during a procedure. We should have the equipment available in the OR to use it routinely in all the cases because if we can, if one patient uh, gets the benefit, you know, of, of using it, and we can avoid one injury in one patient, this is a lot. And we never know when it's going to happen. Thank you very much. And we've got another question in here. Um, what are the costs of the system? It depends on the different companies. I, I, I don't know exactly the cost. Uh, you know, the, usually the, we always say that it's cost effective because the results are there and in the literature they have a demo, we have demonstrated that it uh, decreased complications uh, and the, it is cost effective because the same equipment can be used for different, diff different surgical procedures. So if we have a, a available, a, the, the equipment is available in the OR, the group of colorectal, the group of uh, endocrine surgeons, surgical oncology, general surgeons, all of them can use the same equipment for different indications, for sentinel lymph node, for, evalu for perfusion evaluation, for parathyroid glands identification, and also for uh, bile ducts identification. 
Thank you very much. And we've just got time to squeeze in one last question for you, Dr. Dip. Um, how many cases are needed in order to understand the images when you're first starting out using the procedure? There's not, uh, it has not been evaluated yet what is the number of cases that we really need. We're going to have a discussion in, in Frankfurt uh, next month in order to the determine and to put together what are the, the main guidelines to this uh, technology. But uh, there is uh, certainly a small learning curve in order to understand how uh, it is worked. I don't have, uh, we don't have the exact number of patients, but uh, empir empirically I can, I can tell if you do 10, 15 cases, then you start understanding how everything uh, works. Of course, it will be different for different specialties and according to the experience of the surgeon. And if you have a, a background of a near infrared technology or no, but it's it's easy to use, uh, but you, you need to uh, uh, operate a couple of patients before uh, you trust on the images you're going to see. Thank you very much for answering all of those questions for us and thank you again for your wonderful presentation and thank you to our audience for joining us on today's webinar. Once you leave today's webinar you will receive a survey on the presentation and we'd be really grateful if you could keep your browser window open and complete that and provide your feedback for us. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours which will include a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the International Society of Fluorescence Guided Surgery, with grant funding from Diagnostic Green and a presenter, thank you so much for joining us and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.